I've worked with a lot of people and myself, I, being a pastor, have gone through a lot of things in my life where this world that we live in, it's a broken world, it's a fallen world, isn't it? And because of that, we're always in a little bit of a struggle. Sometimes there's strong struggles. Some, other times it's just lighthearted stuff, but it's still a little bit of a struggle. You stand in faith for things. And one of the things that I've realized being a pastor and working with so many people and then walking out my own faith walk is that, you know, if you don't stay on top of it with your faith, you can be lulled to sleep real easy or you can be overwhelmed with the new battle because you're always facing a new battle or you're coming out of a battle or you might have a minute of reprieve, but you're going into another battle because we live in this world that is just a world full of, there's an enemy of your soul Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, the demons. There's a battle, principalities. We don't fight against flesh and blood, do we? The Bible says that's not our fight. Our fight is against imaginations. In other words, images that come in your mind, the imagination. Your imagination is powerful. It's powerful. Now, I encourage you, use your imagination for the things of God. Use it to dream big and to connect with God. Use your imagination in that way. But I can promise you this, that if you're in a little bit of a battle, the, the enemy of your soul will bring imaginary scenarios to you to try to defeat you. Faith comes by hearing what? The Word. So we said Sunday, we're going to get in the Word. We're going to go to the Word. We're going to renew our mind with the Word. We're going to meditate on the Word. We're going to Soak up the word. Think about the word. Speak the word. And as we do those things, what are we doing? We're building our faith. The book of Jude says this, that you should build yourself up in the most holy faith. How does Jude say to do it? By speaking your prayer language. Pastor, I don't know how my prayer language, how praying in tongues, I don't know how that, and I don't want to get into the whole theology of tongues, what that is right now. Some people believe that tongues is just, you know, uh, a, a language that is an, a language that someone understands. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your personal prayer language to pray in the spirit so that you connect with God. You cannot understand it. And the good news is the devil cannot understand it. But the even better news is that father understands it. And when you use that prayer language in your private, this is private, you're in your car, you're at home, or you're with a couple other people that also do that because you don't want to do that in front of unbelievers or you don't even want to do that in front of uh, really people that are Christians that don't believe necessarily, but that don't understand it. The reason is because it's confusing. I'm glad it's confusing in this note. Let me explain. Because if we could understand it, we would complicate it. You can't understand it. Quit trying to understand it. Get your head out of it and pray in the spirit. Now, the byproduct of that, the scripture says in Jude, is that you build yourself up in the faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, I, then we must spend time working on our faith, everybody. We have got to work on our faith. Because if you don't work on your faith, when that opposition comes, that imaginary stuff and the images, what do we do? How do we fight the battle? We take captive every thought and imagination and we lead it into the obedience of the knowledge, the truth of God's word. And so this is why it takes skill set, it takes application. And then uh, James says it this way, Faith without works or faith without deeds is dead. And the problem with a lot of Christians, I'm not talking about necessarily us, although I think we can struggle with this as well. The problem with a lot of Christians is they've got a lot of book time in, they've got a lot of study time in, they've sat and they've heard a lot of sermons and they have uh, read the Bible. But when it comes to the application of it, you know, you... you you know, a lot of people know the word, but they have no experience applying the word in application. You with me? Yeah. And as long as you don't apply it, faith without works is dead. So you can have all this book information. A friend of mine is a pilot 
and he flies jets, and he always has to be uh, uh, certified on that jet. But here's what they do. They start out in ground school, and in ground school, it's like what we do every time we come in. We're in ground school here tonight, and uh, the good news is, the good news is you're getting good education, but it really doesn't mean anything until you get in the simulator, the flight simulator. And the amazing thing about these planes, these jets, is they have simulators for each different type of jet. So if you're going to be certified on that particular jet, you go to ground school, and it takes days and sometimes weeks to go through ground school. You're studying this stuff. You're taking tests on it. And then you get in the simulator. And you know what happens in the simulator? They create all kinds of problems for you to get you educated. So they start a fire in the plane. They start a fire in the engine. They start a fire in the cockpit. Wind shears come along as you're training in the simulator. Thank God it's a simulator, right? But they have wind shears. They have thunderstorms. They have lightning. They have all of these different scenarios in the simulator so that you can get practice and get experience learning how to deal with issues and problems. And then at some point, after you've gone through all the training, you start to fly. Now, a lot of people just go, you know what? I want to go back to ground school. I don't feel like I know it enough. I want to go back to ground school. And they keep going to ground school and keep going to ground school and put me in the simulator again. But flying this real plane, oh, that's a whole different world. I was thinking back on my dad. My dad took flying lessons. And boy, he has some stories. Ruth Bell the other day said, Pastor, I love it when you tell your dad's stories. And I'll tell you one, at the Bethalto Airport, he was soloing, you know, he had gone through ground school. He had gone through his, his uh, flying with the uh, uh, instructor. And then, you know, he had flown quite a bit, but now he's all alone. My dad said that it changed his whole perspective being up there because there was a confidence that came knowing that the instructor instructor could take over at any second. And all of a sudden, he's up there and the whole thing is on him. And guess what happened that day? The wind came real strong. So he's getting ready to land. And, you know, they had to do this thing. I think they call it the crawl. or I don't think they call it the creep. (laughs) But you have to literally, you literally have to fly at an angle. You're flying in, facing that direction. But in order to to do it the right way, you're flying in like this, right? Kind of sideways, you're flying in. And all of a sudden, just as he's getting ready to land, the wind just blew his plane about 20 feet off of the runway. Now he's like, oh, no, I have to do a go around. So he did a go around. He didn't land. He went around. He called the tower and said, I'm going to do a go around. He went around. Now, he's by himself. And he's coming in again, and this time the wind wasn't there, and he was able to fly straight. And all of a sudden, that wind blew him off again, and he wasn't sideways, but there he was. This time, he goes right by the tower. I mean, like 15 feet from the tower. He's waving at everybody in the tower. (laughs) The look on their faces, he said, was total fear. They were like, oh, no, he's coming in here. So he went around the second time. The third time, he said, he's coming in, and you wouldn't believe what happened the third time. It blew him again. And this time, he said, he was close to the tower. He said, this time, there was nobody in the tower. They had left. Gone. These were people of wisdom. <laughs> and then the fourth time he was panicking. He said this. He said that in his heart and in his soul, he said, okay, Lord, if this is the, my last day on earth, you know, w- w- whatever, I'm good to go home. And, and he, that time he was able to land the plane. What a story. He made it, but he, guess what? He was done flying after that. He really was. He didn't go back up. He said, It's not worth it to me. He was doing it recreationally. But I say that to you because a lot of times we as Christians and we as believers, we do the same exact thing with our faith. We study the word. We can get excited in church service like this because, man, we're praising the Lord. And by the way, there's something 
awesome that happens when we're together. This is why church services, all of you online, it's great that you're online, and all of you on Facebook, it's great that you're on Facebook, but if you get in the house, something incredible happens. Our faith gets built uh, by the experience of doing life with others. Why? Because we encourage one another. There's nothing like having people that encourage your faith. When you're going through something, you know, one of the things that I encourage you to do is watch what comes out of your mouth because it's a, it's a sign of where your heart is. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth flaps. That's the street lingo, as your mouth speaks. But a lot of times our mouth just instantly goes blah, 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 and negative, right? So we're gonna learn. I'm gonna give you a few scriptures John, not John, I'm, I've moved my notes, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, therefore, and I think this is the word you quoted, Becky, this is amazing. Therefore, since we are justified and declared righteous through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have peace and reconciliation to hold, and watch this word, enjoy the peace of God. Through him, we also have access and interest, uh, I- entrance by faith into the grace of God. Grace is God's ability. And let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. Let us also be full of joy now. When? When I get my prayer answered. No, now. Come on, now, right? So, I mentioned to you Numbers chapter 13. We're going to go to the New Testament first, and then we'll look at that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says uh, about them, about the Old Testament example, nevertheless, God was not pleased with the great majority of them. Remember I told you about the Pareto principle? You have 10 out of the 10, two usually get it right, 20% gets it right, the other 80% usually get it wrong. Don't always go with the masses and the majority and the big crowd. We want to be the remnant. Yeah, we want to be the 20%. We want to be the Joshua's and the Caleb's. That's who we want to be. He says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with the great majority of them. They were overthrown and strewn along the ground of the desert in the wilderness. Verse 6 says, now these things are examples. Watch, this is New Testament. These are examples and warnings and admonition for us to not desire, crave, or covet, lust after evil carnal things as they did, not to be worshipers of false gods as some of them were. You know that series I did, the last one on breaking the norm? Most of us would not think we are worshipers of false gods, but if you were here through that whole series, you would realize, oh, oh, oh. We've been worshiping false gods, church people. See how quiet it is in here? If you didn't know that, go back and listen to every one of those installments because the, the, the spirit of Baal is alive and well in the world today and even in the church world. We don't call it Baal anymore. What we call it is not taking a break and we're, we just try to handle all of our situations ourselves. We try to work our way out of everything. That's Baal worship. It's not looking to God. Asherah worship is my flesh wants what it wants and it wants what it wants when it wants it. I know I'm not a a, a worshiper of Asherah, but yet at the same time, as a believer, if I don't fight this and resist, if I don't have resistance to the things of the enemy, my flesh, what's I mean, it can be food, it can be pleasure, it can be all kinds of different things, right? And then the rubber meets the road on that big one, the spirit of mammon that's alive and well. That's probably the strongest one that's alive in the church world today is mammon. And it's evident because of the Pareto principle that less, less than 20% of the church tithes. It's, a, it's, a, it's an abomination. It's a sickening thing. It, it just is. It's just, I'm, I'm, I'm loving you enough to tell you the truth. It's gross, really because it's an indictment against our own faith when out of, you know, 100% of the people that walk in, probably like somewhere between 13 and 18% actually tithe. I'll move on, but you know, Jesus, that's where Jesus said, you're either worshiping 
mammon or you're worshiping God, you're going to be loyal to one and you're going to hate the other. I know, I know. He says in verse 9, we shouldn't tempt the Lord and try his patience. This is New Testament, everybody. But I, I thought, PD, I thought we were to experience and enjoy the unconditional love of Christ. You are. But you're mixing it up with your faith. Your sins are forgiven. He doesn't hold that over your head. But I can tell you this, there's a promised land for you to enter. There's a peace for you to enter. There's a joy for you to experience. And you need a pastor and group of pastors and teachers that'll say, hey, don't misunderstand. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let him confuse you. Come on, there's a promised land and we can go into it together. Not just, not just two out of every 10. Come on, everybody, let's all go into the promised land. He says in verse 11, these things befell them by way of the figure as an example to warn us. They were written as an admonishment to fit us for right action. We're not just in school, in ground school. We're going to act. Faith without the works is dead stuff. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands and feels sure that he has steadfast mind is standing firm, take heed, or lest he fall. What's he saying? Be careful or you'll blow it without realizing it. For no temptation, no matter how or where it comes from, has overtaken you and laid hold of you that is not common to man. In other words, sometimes we go through some trials that rock our world and we think we're the only one going through it. No, 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 we're all going through it. Some of us have been through that. Some of us have been through that. But we all go through it. Yeah. You're all fighting battles of faith. Yeah. Misery loves company, everybody. We're all going through it together at different times. But if you have a, if you have a testimony and you've gone through it, help us. Yeah. Tell us your testimony. Yeah. Amen. No temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance. See the key. I'm going to tell you the key to winning this battle of faith and dealing with this worry is resistance. Pastor, how do I resist? I'll teach you, okay? Make sure you don't miss the rest of what I say tonight and don't miss next week. How do I resist? It says God is faithful to his word and he is, com he is compassionate in his nature. and He can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried beyond your ability yeah. and strength to resist yeah. and give you the power to endure. He always provides a way out, yeah. a means of escape, so that you'll be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under it with patience. Now, we think in the, when we read a scripture like this, we think of sin typically. And it is sin he's talking about, but he's also talking about the temptation because this is sin that was also that all hell's broken loose against you and now you're tempted to doubt God. Doubt is a sin. You and I are tempted. I've been tempted to doubt God. Thoughts of doubt have come at me before. Frustration has come to me before. I've been frustrated before. And here's what the Lord spoke to me. Frustration is, if, you're, if I'm frustrated, Darren, if you're frustrated, you are not in faith. Faith is not frustrated, everybody. Think about it. I'm in faith. Well, we're, I'm just frustrated. And then out of my mouth, I say, it's just not working. How many of you know, faith doesn't talk like that. Faith doesn't say it's not working. Faith doesn't say, I'm so frustrated. Faith has the joy of now. Why, why does faith have the joy of now? Because now faith is the substance of the things I'm hoping for. It's the evidence of the things that haven't changed yet. But guess what? When did I get my victory? Now. I've got the victory now. So I'm not going to let that negativity and that, I'm going to resist that negativity. Hebrews 4 verse 1 says, the promise of entering his rest still holds and is being offered today. Let's be afraid, if you're going to be afraid of something, the verse says this, let's be afraid to distrust the promise. Oh, I need to be afraid of not believing God. If I'm going to be afraid of anything, 
I'm going to be afraid of speaking negativity. I'm going to be afraid of not resisting. Are you with me so far? So the Israelites of old, when the good news of deliverance from bondage came to them, they heard the message, but they didn't benefit from it because, watch this part, it wasn't mixed with faith. Ah, oh, God said you're delivered. God said you're free. God said, I have given you the promised land. I've given you the victory. I'm dealing with worry, everybody. Yeah. Every human being in this room have dealt with it. We've all dealt with it. So there's no condemnation in that. But if you want to win and if you want to enter your promised land, he's saying the promise of entering this rest still holds. It's being offered today. Hey, anybody want their promised land? Yeah. See, if it was true for them and how much more us than them, it didn't benefit them because they didn't mix it with faith. Let me just teach you something. You have to mix the promise that you're believing for. You have to mix it with your faith. I can't develop your faith, but I can be there to encourage you. I can be there to teach you what faith is. But at the end of that day, you have to develop your faith. You have to develop your faith. Your wife can't do it for you. Your husband can't do it for you. And your pastor can't do it for you. Although we can lead by example, although we can teach the word, you have to believe. Those who heard it, he says, neither were they united in faith with the ones Joshua and Caleb, who heard and did believe, this is the good news. Those of you that are walking in faith, the Pareto, the 20% of you, here's the good news. You inspire us. You do. And when we unite together, a powerful spiritual principle is, in, is effective. It's enacted. When your faith is strong, when your faith is strong, the good news is we come together. And when someone else's faith is a little bit weak, they can call you up. This is why you always need faith buddies. This is the benefit of our small groups, that your faith buddies will encourage you. Yes. And you can call them, and you don't have to talk negative to them. You can just give them a little cue, and they'll go off on you in a positive way. <laughs> you know, like, like, hey, you know, I know, I know you're person of faith, could you, could you remind me again how healed I am? Could you remind me again how God provides for me? And let them just start going off on you. Oh, let me tell you how blessed you are. Let me tell you how healed you are. By his stripes, you are healed. You just sit back, soak it up, agree with them. Amen. <laughs> I love it. I love it. For we who have believed do enter the rest in accordance with his declaration. He said, although his works have been completed and prepared and waiting for those who believe from the foundations of the world. Here's what Jesus is saying to us in the New Testament. Your promised land has already been prepared for you. It's already done. He said on that cross, it is finished. So how do we do this? We fight the good fight of faith. Faith is something that takes our effort of resistance. We don't fight people. Your battle isn't against the government. It is against principalities and powers uh, rulers of darkness of the air that try to lie to you, that accuse you, the accuser of the brethren. Your battle is your own imagination and the imagination of the enemy, the fear that he tries to bring at you. Fight the good fight of faith. How do I do that, pastor? Resist by bringing every one of those thoughts to the word. Have a praise party. I mentioned that Sunday, have a praise party. My wife and I, we have praise parties all the time. We have praise parties for our children. We have praise parties for the church. We have praise parties for our health, for your health. We have praise parties for financial blessing, for you, for the church, for us personally. See, because you, one way you can resist the enemy, the Bible says that if you resist him, he will flee from you. 
One way you can resist, the enemy does not want to hear while all, he's accusing you of all this stuff, which in most people, the 80%, it brings fear, it brings negativity, it brings discouragement. Come on. When he screams in most Christians' ears, you're not going to make it. Feel depressed. Feel it. Feel the depression. And when you and I say, oh, no, I'm, what am I doing? I'm resisting. Oh, no. Oh, the Lord is good. I, but, but, but I'm not being dignified when I do that. Guess what? Now it's time to really get it on. Oh, I'm telling you, I have got the victory. Lord, you're good. You're faithful to your word. You never, ever lie. You never let us down when we embrace the truth. And though it might be scary a little bit, we're going to fly this jet. We're going to fly this plane. We're going to go into it. We know that you've got us covered. You've got our backs. Are you with me? And he said that those who would believe from the foundation of the earth, the, the, the Lord, he chose you. He called you. John chapter 6, in the spirit of who gives life, he is the life giver, Jesus is. The flesh, this is what my flesh does. This is why I got to be careful of what my feelings are. I have to make a decision that I will manage my feelings. My feelings will not manage me. I declare in the name of Jesus. Now, the reason I can preach this like this is because I battle this just like you do. But the difference is, is I'm your pastor. If I don't get victory in this, you need a new pastor. You don't need a wimpy pastor that says, well, I get it right once in a while. I, I've got to stay in this thing constantly. And, and so I've got to have victory so that I can teach it from a stance of victory, Pastor Laura and I. We've got to teach you this from us walking this thing out as an example. Paul said it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. And we really can't preach these messages with conviction unless we're walking them out too. Amen. It says the flesh conveys no benefit. Whatever there is, there is no profit in it. <laughs> my feelings, my emotions that are not managed by my choice, my decision, those have no benefit. They don't benefit you. They don't benefit me. The words, truth, have been spoken to you, and they are spirit, and they are life. This is why I go to the word, and I begin to agree with what the word says with whatever battle you're, you know, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. I am healed. I'm not going to get healed. I am already healed. By his stripes, I was healed. Listen to what he says in 64. These are the words of Jesus, by the way. But still, some of you fail to believe and trust and have faith. Mm -mm. That is not going to be our testimony, church. Amen. You're a remnant church. Romans 5, verse 4. Endurance creates character. And character creates confidence, not arrogance, confidence. See, here's my prayer for you, is that you resist to the point where you renew your mind, where you have these praise parties, and when, the, when you do have the praise party, the devil leaves. Now, he might try to come back five minutes later, but you just have another praise party, he'll leave again, you get a reprieve, and then you meditate on the word, you declare the word, you proclaim the word, out of the abundance of your head and your heart, You've renewed the word. You've thought about the word. You're speaking the word. And the word out of your heart begins to declare in agreement with God, not my emotions and not my feelings and definitely not my circumstances. It says it, this endurance of resisting creates character and character creates confidence. Verse five, you've heard this before. We are not ashamed to have this confidence because it's God's love that had been poured out in our hearts. By who? By the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you. Here's the good news. You've got the Holy Spirit. He lives on the inside of you. That's why Jude said in the book of Jude, 
that you can build yourself up in the faith by praying in your prayer language. I know people don't want to hear it. That's praying in tongues. I ain't going to pray in tongues. That's weird. That's weird. Well, you need to renew your mind with it and go, hey, this is a God thing. It's a gift from God, and I'm going to use it. Just use it. Use it. You don't have to use it in front of people if you don't want to. Use it in front of your husband or your wife. But, I mean, don't get weird and for sure don't get scared of it because you're missing the power of the Holy Spirit to work on the inside of you. Romans 10 says this in verse 2. It says, I know they loved God, but they didn't understand what makes people acceptable to him. So they refused to trust. They tried to be accepted by God by obeying the law. That doesn't work. You approach him by believing his word and confessing out of your mouth. Are you with me so far? Okay, so we have to resist. We have to fight the good fight, cast down those imaginations that come at us. And then you have to ask yourself, what are you believing? Not what do I believe in general? What am I believing at this moment? Because of what I speak, a true sign of it is when crisis really happens. You know, you get a phone call, there's been a car accident. Uh, I had that happen one Saturday afternoon. I'm getting ready to come to church. And I'm on a road and I look up ahead and there's fire trucks and there's ambulances and the traffic was backed up. And a phone call comes in and I answer the phone and the voice on the other end of the phone said, hello, is this Mr. Karstens? I said, yes, yes it is. I have no idea that that accident up there involved one of my children. And he said, Mr. Karstens, your daughter has been in an accident. We don't know how severe that it is but we're going to transport them to the hospital. I'm sure there's broken bones and I'm sure there's blood. I couldn't have got to the scene if I wanted to because the traffic was so backed up. All I could do, my, in, my instinctive response seems that I'm on my way to preach to you guys. I don't think I've ever told this story publicly. Was to confess the word. So the very first thing I do is start praising the Lord. It's the best thing and the first thing I did. God, you're good. You're good all the time. I've stood on your promises, Lord. You're faithful to your word. I'm a child of covenant. Psalms 91 is my word for my family. You will not steal my children. You'll not harm them. You have dispatched angels to stand guard around them. And so once the traffic cleared, I drove to the hospital. I barely made it to the Saturday night, five o'clock service. The car was totaled, but not only was my daughter in the accident, my niece was in the accident with her in the car. And there were no broken bones, although at the scene, they knew there were broken bones. There was blood all inside of the car. But amazing how good God is when we got to the hospital, they were doing good. Oh, they were a little bit sore. Some glasses were broke. And the blood was superficial. It was just a bloody nose from the airbags. Here's what I want to say to you. What you do in a moment of crisis is very important. I have told this story before, and I want to just remind you before I close. I'm going to pick up next week. We're going to, we're going to go a little bit deeper. One Wednesday night, five minutes before the service started, I'm putting the final touches on the message right upstairs here in this office. My phone rings, it's my daughter. And I think to myself, she lives over near Farmington. And, and, and I think to myself, she never calls me right before church. I better answer this. And I picked up the phone and on the other line, I said, hello. And she said, 
Daddy, 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 Lenora's dead. Lenora's dead. Lenora is our youngest grandchild. She's three, a little over three now. Get ready to turn four soon. She was the, about 18 months at the time. Lenora's dead. Lenora's dead. She's just blue. She has no oxygen. We just called the ambulance the hospital locally here. They are transporting her by helicopter to Children's Hospital. She has no pulse. She has no oxygen. We don't know how long she was without oxygen. And uh, the accident that occurred, we have a, a grandson that uh, has a, a autism and he had sat on her while she was in the bathroom and she couldn't breathe. We don't know how long, but she, was, she had turned completely blue. And I'm getting ready to come out here to preach. My first response was to hang the phone up and say, okay, I'm in my office. I can get in here a little bit late, but in my office, I said, Jesus, Jesus, I know you and I know how good you are. I'm not praying and asking you for any outcome at this point. All I'm doing, Jesus, is declaring the goodness of God. I'm putting a smile on my face. I'm choosing the spirit of joy on the inside of me. I declare you are faithful to your word. You are faithful to your promises. And whatever the outcome is, I will faithfully walk with you with joy. And I will proclaim you to be God. And I will proclaim you to be healer. I will proclaim your goodness for you are awesome. You are awesome, God. You are awesome. And I'm praising him in my office. And the byproduct of the praise put a spirit of peace on the inside of me. I didn't confess any negativity out. I didn't say, oh my God. I smiled big intentionally and said, you know what, God? After I praised him, I said, you know what, God? This life is brief and I've got joy and I've got trust in you, but I'm gonna do what I know to do and I'm going to resist with my faith the report that I just heard and I will declare the goodness of you. I declare over Lenora's body. I declare you are her healer and there will be no sign of this on her and that she will come to life. I said, Father, I speak oxygen to enter her lungs at this time. Enter her lungs. Come to life, Lenora. I call you to life, Lenora, in the name of Jesus. I speak life to you. And I declare that. And I said, Lord, I trust you with the outcome. I've done what I know to do. And that's that I've kept my joy. I've got my peace. And you won't steal that from me, devil. I'm going to have it whatever the outcome, but I'm declaring her to live and not die. I'm declaring oxygen go into her body. I'm declaring no brain damage. I'm declaring a blessing. So I preach and I preach just like I'm preaching tonight. You never knew about it. I didn't tell you about it. I didn't need anybody's pity. I didn't want any of that junk. I don't need that crap. I need my faith high. You fight the battle. It's in those moments you choose who you're gonna be with. I didn't wanna be with anybody that's gonna start weeping and crying, oh my God, oh, I don't need that. You don't need that. I'm trying to show you how to fight this fight. So I didn't tell anybody that. And once it was all over, I told my wife and my children, I'm gonna drive over to the hospital. And one of my children went with me to the hospital. We walk in that room and there's Lenora. She's all hooked up to breathing tubes and and wires all over, man. And they were monitoring everything, but she looked up at me with that little smile. Well, let me say this, last night the phone rang and all the grandkids were on speakerphone and Lenora would not let any of them talk. <laughs> Lenora was like, Papa C, hi, hi Mimi, Mimi C. And that's, that's Mimi right there. And she, they all were trying to talk, but she was fighting them back and nobody else could talk because Lenora's mouth was going for it. 
She said, Papa, see, when can I come back and see you? Let me just say this to you. I encourage you, resist. Don't give in to those negative thoughts, those fearful thoughts, those worry-filled thoughts, the anxiety. Don't give in to that. Fight it. By the way, you don't have to do this just one time. You got to do this oftentimes every day of your life. Sometimes I've said to the Lord, Lord, you know, I've fought a lot of battles. I've had a lot. We have had a lot together. We've stood for, believed for. We're believing for stuff today. And there comes a place where you say, I, 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 you know, at times where you say, I don't want to fight today, but you got to fight today. You got to resist again. You got to believe again. You got to confess again. You don't live by your feelings. You manage your feelings and your emotions. In fact, one of the things that I've learned a few years ago that I've really started working on is choosing my emotions. Now, I don't always get it right, but I'm working on it. And I'm going to get better and better at it, choosing my emotions. I choose joy. I choose joy. I choose peace. I'm going to receive the rest in my heart that though the enemy would threaten me, though the enemy would declare, you know, this way or that way, I'm saying, Lord, I, I, we've got this. Why not us, but because we trust in you. You're faithful to your word. You've always been faithful. You're not a man that you could lie. It's impossible for you to lie. And it's impossible for me to please you without faith. So I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to live by faith. I refuse to worry and have anxiety. And when it comes, I will resist it. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray for every person. In fact, if you're struggling with joy and you just want me to pray, just have you stand right there where you're at. I'll declare this blessing over you. I won't have you come forward, but I'll declare for you with what you're believing for. Father, as you can see, we're in fights. We're fighting the fight of faith. I pray for these, your children, and these, your people. I bind the spirit of fear, of intimidation, of anxiety, of worry, of fret. I bind it. I break that spirit over their minds. The lies and the imaginations that come as a result of the battle that we're in, I declare peace like a blanket drop on your people. <laughs> I declare in this service the victory and the breakthrough of the high calling of God. We take those thoughts and those imaginations and we lead them into the obedience of the word. We resist those images, those fears, those worries, those, those anxieties. So I declare victory over you tonight. Your pastors, we declare victory over you tonight. You've got it. You can bank on God. You can trust God. You can believe God. Now at this point, what do you do? You take action. Don't don't just sit there passively. Take an action. Have a praise party. Pray in your prayer language. Declare the word. Declare it over your situation. I'm declaring it over you. But when you get in that car by yourself or you get at home in your bedroom or in the bathroom, you begin to declare that word over your life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.